and welcome to this webinar on blogging for teaching and learning. I am Lance Eaton. I'm Associate Director of Learning Design here in the Rab School of Continuing Studies at Brandeis. Uh, and today we're going to talk about blogging and the ways it can be used for uh, course interaction, learning, and uh, the different ways you might apply it or think about using it for your course. So the first thing to always figure out is uh, what we're gonna do today, which is first just talk about blogging, about its relationship to education, uh, different ways you might consider blogging or having your students blog within a course, and just some technical elements to consider about blogging. So the first is what is a blog? What is blogging? Um, a lot of people, I mean, the term has been around now for well, probably close to 15 years or so in different capacities. Some people are really familiar with it, others hear of it, but they're not quite sure what it is. So the basic definition of what is a blog is it's a website in which individual or group users uh, record opinions, information, et cetera, on a regular basis. So rather than a traditionally static page or uh, a page where you go where content isn't really updated that regularly, uh, this is seen as an entity in which part of the new and you know the idea is that new content is regularly being uploaded by writers uh, content creators of, of different sorts around a particular topic or subject so therefore the verb to blog is of course you know adding that new material or uh, to regularly update that blog and this can be done in a variety of ways usually you know it can be text-based uh, you can have images you can also intersperse video and audio and the like but predominantly it's been considered very strongly text-based and one of the best analogies that my uh, a colleague of mine once described it as is in some ways it's the internet's editorial page uh, that people go on there in and really interesting i mean there's certainly some irrelevant and irreverent blogs out there uh, but there's also some really powerful interesting ones on any any topic that you can imagine so why would you want to incorporate blogging into a course? What would be useful around that? Well, the first is, of course, there's always this idea of uh, creating this dialogue beyond class time or beyond the confines of a learning management system, right? So the traditional environment within uh, a learning management system is to, to have discussion is a forum. And, those have their use, but they also can feel very formulated where there's a bit more uh, free flowing approach to or consideration when using a blog. It's also you can structure and create this, con this, this dynamic of having a conversation with the larger world. So rather than confining some of our some of the topics, some of the, the ideas that have these long term implications beyond just the classroom, bringing that conversation out into the community and encouraging this dialogue between what your students are learning and what others, whether that be specialists in the field or other people that are interested in the topic can partake in and join in on the conversation. It's also a great place to start to integrate ongoing research, create dialogue across with other blogs that are providing or sharing current research. Uh, it's a place to apply or translate what's going on in the, the research of a particular discipline or within a particular field. Uh, just a way to really be active and thinking more, uh, more as a process of putting out there the, the knowledge that's being constructed both in the course and in the field. It is also, I think, particularly for students, an opportunity to try a new writing style or creating content creating style. Uh, many students are familiar, of course, with you know the traditional papers. If they're in online programs like here in GPS, they're also familiar with you know the standard uh, assignments or the standard discussions, and this gives them something else to think about how they might translate some of the things they're learning into this different style, into something that is a bit editorial, can also be a bit visual, can be a bit more recognizing a social space where ideas are exchanged and challenged and interacted with that is, again, different from a discussion where it's only the people in the course that really see or, or can interact with one another. Opening it up to the larger world creates a, a more natural or realistic expectation of how the world will respond, which for people looking to uh, go into different careers, 
understanding that and starting to build some of the skill set around engaging with that could be quite useful. And then it also helps students to become more meaningful content creators, right? So this, they are not just learning these new tools and this, this new style around writing and creating, uh, but it's also getting them to think about, well, what are the different delivery ways, delivery mechanisms with which they can connect in their industry? What are the different ways they can think about not just being consumers of information in online courses, but actually creators of information or uh, spa creating spaces where they can communicate their ideas differently than what they would or in a larger, broader audience than what they would. Uh, I think that has a lot of potential for students because it gives them that one more that one more tangible experience, that one more tangible thing they can take with them once they move beyond the classroom. So one thing to think about is if you are, you know, if, if this is sounding interesting, you're thinking about, well, then how might I introduce a blog or what might be the dynamics or the, the ways I would construct that within a course? That's what we want to take a look at now. So one thing you want to think about is, and some of these are just kind of recommendations about considerations as you're designing or as you're structuring what that blog might look like. So the first is, is this something apart from the course or integrated into it? And so what I mean is, is this something students are largely doing on their own and there's no clear way or there's no consistent way in which it's brought back into the course? Uh, or is that blog kind of a, a, central, a central rallying point and discussion space? for the course. Uh, I've seen these done both ways. I've done these both ways. I think apart from, the, if you're doing it as a, apart from the course, then you might think about more of encouraging the student, student's ownership and helping the student think about this as a space, uh, if not for an e-portfolio, as a demonstration of uh, something they would put in an e-portfolio. So getting them to kind of own this little piece of property on the internet to really start to write about and demonstrate their learning and understanding in the field. If it's integrated into the course, then really thinking about how each week can build upon uh, what's been done pre previously and also embrace what is coming down the pike. I think it's important to, as I've already mentioned and, and discussed previously, it's important to think of this as a different discussion space. Uh, think of it not necessarily as just, you know, a discussion, but with the public, but really thinking about this as, as more of a place of dialogue um, than here's a prompt, you respond to it, you look at other people and you respond to it, and more as a how do we start to think about communicating in a public sphere about the things that we are pursuing degrees in and the things that we are, by the time we finish a program, you know, we are going to have an advanced degree in. How do we how do we start to make that transition or how do we maximize the opportunities of that transi transition and help our students think about publicly engaging with one another and the world abroad about the ideas that they're coming at, you know, the, the ideas that they're embracing, the ideas that they're challenged by, uh, or the things that they want to do based upon what they're learning in the programs. It can also be thought of as kind of a field journal or applied reflection journal space. So again, here it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic where you can have students write about either things that they're observing. So if your classroom is, you know, say you have a course on uh, digital media, then maybe each week, you know, they are going out there into the wild of the internet and finding examples with which to discuss what it was that they've seen. And so what you have happen is that blog, if you create it as one singular blog where students are sharing this, you also start to create this really wonderful archive that future students can go back to and learn and see and what other students have done. And that's probably one of the other things that we'll talk about a little bit later is if you create a course, one singular course blog, you also capture the history of past courses and past posts which means students can learn from other students. Students can appreciate the, uh, what you know, a student from two semesters ago posted around a particular example or a particular uh, concept that they were blogging about. And again, also that applied reflection journal, that idea of you know, whatever they're learning in the course, they take this space to 
think about it in, again, think about it publicly, think about it in a way that invites conversation. It can also be a, a really interesting place to do role playing. Uh, I had a faculty member who was, she was teaching the um, plant life cycle and what she did, and I, I still love this, uh, she assigned each of the students a different role in the plant life cycle. You know, and some of them were like, you know, different types of germs or things that are in the soil. Others were certain types of soil. You know, somebody was the nitrogen, all of these things. And so over the course of a semester, which happened to be the spring semester, each week they had to blog about what they were going through and how they were interacting with the other pieces. So it was a matter of posting, like, here's what's going on this week and me as nitrogen for, you know, in the middle of February. Uh, but then also go and interact with and, and reply to other parts of the plant life system to which they would be actually interacting with. So it's just a really fascinating, really creative way to create that space and keep it as an ongoing thing throughout the semester that's, you know, all there to be traced out on that blog. Uh, it's also just a really great place to get students thinking about and considering, you know, in the real world. So lots of times we have these simulations, we have these uh, discussions, and now is a chance for them to actually get their toes wet, for them to actually start to offer up ideas and, and thoughts out there in the real world. And by doing so, also start to develop a bit more of their digital presence, a bit more of their digital uh, footprint, if you will. We know today, we know today that between when you put in a application or, you know, a resume for a job and when you get the interview, there's the Google search. And how cool would it be if part of what we're doing here is helping students enhance their digital profile because now they're blogging about subjects on which they are now applying for jobs, right? So they can, you know, somebody goes and Googles them and they find out, oh, here's the student who is doing some really interesting posts and interesting ideas about this field on this blog. They're not just, you know, they're not just here applying for a job, but they are actually really interested and I can see it in their writing or in their, the creations of their posts. It can also be a space of, you know, news, newspaper reporting, creating the course as a kind of, you know, uh, field team for what is going on in this industry, in this area right now. And so students are pushed or encouraged to pursue certain topics, certain issues to which they're going to synthesize a bunch of articles or research or what have you and share that out. So again, it's this idea of you can really encourage them to do things. And again, over the course of the semester, that might be harder to do in a week by week discussion format. And then it can also just, you know, it can, I shouldn't say just, it can also be a group journaling about the course. So it's a space where students can go in and really have conversations about uh, and post their ideas or, or just their, their reflections individually in pairs, you know, create these as, you know, uh, two students creating their own little discussion within posts or responding to one another's posts with their own posts and, and just kind of create this really interesting web of interaction among them. Uh, that you don't always get to, or it's much hard, it can be much harder to see within the, you know, the reply to the reply to the reply uh, that we'll see within discussions. And similar to a discussion, you can also set it up as this prompt and response, um, getting students to apply that week's learning to a, around a particular prompt. But again, I think the the opportunity to think more laterally, the opportunity to integrate, and I'll say easier, because you can integrate media into, into uh, the LMS posts, but I think you'll find with blogs, it's often easier to integrate. If you wanna embed a video, if you want to bring in some images, some sounds, because it's much more, it's much simpler than what we often see within a learning management system. So there are a couple different ways to actually approach blogging. Um, the first is, and I, I've done all three of these, so I will speak to, you know, what are some of the, the benefits and the drawbacks once we get through them. Uh, the first is the instructor blogs. They create a series of posts that they release over the semester 
and the students respond to those posts and they respond to one another. You create conversations around each blog post. Uh, the instructor creates and manages the blog, but all of the students have access and they post blog posts to that blog. So it's kind of, it's one centralized space and all the students go there to post their individual blog posts. And then students create their own blogs, either as individuals or groups. Now, each one of these comes with, their, with certain trade-offs. Um, the first one, I think it ends up limiting just what students can get to do and how creative they can get because they're largely just replying to what the instructor has put. But if it's your first time playing around with the blog, that might be the, the initial step that you take. Get comfortable with blogging yourself so that then you can use that to teach the students or help them understand what they may want to do or how they might want to set up their own posts. I think the second one is most ideal, at least initially and organizationally. So in this case, you would have, you know, you are essentially the editor and each student are, you know, the, the reporters, so to speak. They're going to post their blogs or they're going to they're going to publish their posts and you're going to try to make sure that it kind of all fits together or if you see any issues um, within one or beyond, you can both go in and edit or fix those if need be, or you can, it's more easy to nudge the students. It also gives you more control over who can and can't uh, access the blog at certain points. So at a later point, you might not want students to be able to come back and, and edit as much, say the next semester, uh, you have more control over that. The third one I think is, so let me step back. The, the second one, what's also good is everything is in one space. There's only one blog. There's only one address that you have to go to, that the other students have to go to. That's, it's a pretty straightforward space. The next one, students create their own blogs. On one hand, it's really good if you want to encourage and empower the students to keep blogging after this, or you structure it in such a way that they create a lot of great content that they may want to hold on to. But the challenge is you then have as many websites or addresses to go to as you do students or groups that create their own blogs. So if you've got 10 students and they create 10 blogs, that's 10 different places you have to go to look at. That's 10 different places they all have to go to look at one another's work. So it's not like it's not great in that there's a bit extra amount of clicking going on, um, but it can be useful if you're thinking about this in some way in which it does become something like their own uh, portfolio of sorts or students really do want to own uh, or continue to blog after the course. So those are the three different ways of, of, you know, of creating a blog or, or having the students engage through the blog. Um, and then we also have, I surprised myself, I had a fourth one, um, class and conversation with the community. So this would be an example where um, you would actively have students not just with their own blogs, but looking and finding other blog, uh, other blogs out there or other blogging communities out there to which they are finding intentional means of either posting on those blogs as guest posts or making sure to snippet link and pull material from those blogs. Um, in that case, you could, you could probably use any of the three previous, but you may also find them really, this really interesting reach out and interaction with these other spaces that um, you don't necessarily have to create a blog, but rather have them go off onto other people's blogs or find places that they can actually uh, post and engage with across the blog sphere, as they call it. So a couple things to, to recommend around the actual facilitating and, and teaching around this. Uh, the first is, as always, make sure you spend time teaching the tool to students. Uh, this can be either running a webinar, or not a webinar session, but maybe running a uh, office hour or two via Zoom to make sure you know they're on board or that they can get their answers, their questions answered as quickly as possible. Uh, but also, do you have the right support materials? Have you made it clear to walk students through how they either set up their own blog or get onto the blog that you've created, et cetera? Um, 
and this is really important, just making sure you have those, those technical support documents. You know, one of the favorite things from one of my mentors uh, around using technology in the classroom is, of course, when you use technology in the classroom as an instructor, you are the default IT person. So you want to make sure you found some good support documents and also identified some procedures for students to follow if they run into a problem. Like what is that chain of things they should do? Uh, and it may be just directly contact you or it might be first take a screenshot or something like that. I'd also really emphasize that LinkedIn Learning is a great place to get tutorials around using uh, Blogger, WordPress, Tumblr, these are the, the most popular ones that I'll recommend shortly. Um, but that could be a great place to get some of those tutorials for them. Provide clear guidelines. Um, you know, that, that seems obvious, but sometimes it isn't. And then also make sure you provide some example posts. Because I think for many students, this may be abstract until they're doing it. But if they have something they can look at and say, does my post look like this post? Uh, then you might, be, you might help them get further along than without those examples. Create a low stakes first assignment to get them situated and familiar with the tool. This is always a really good idea when dealing with technology in a classroom. Uh, so it might be just do an introductory post or, you know, do a post that's up for a week and then you can delete it. But just make sure you show me that you can create a post, you can embed a video, you can include an image, whatever those, those expectations are that you anticipate them needing to do or wanting them to do. Uh, regularly or at least once or twice throughout the semester. Think about whether you want them or to what degree do you want them replying on the blog. So should they be replying? If they should be replying to one another's posts, how many should they be replying to? What should be the approach to replying? Should they be drawing or linking to additional materials? Should they be linking to other blog posts and making connections within the blog itself or beyond the blog? And then, you know, you might want to think about gradually penalizing technical issues after giving substantive feedback. That is, if you have through the first five weeks, you know, really been supporting and identifying like, here are the things that you need to do, but you don't seem, you know, we're in week five and you still don't seem to know how to do a hyperlink. You know, I've made this video, I've provided you these, these um, issues kind of making sure they know that the technical aspect of this is just as important as the content in that it's very much when we look at the, the technical pieces online, such as how to make a hyperlink, having done this, this type of assignment blogging with students, that's one of the things some of them, you know, falter with. They expect that it just shows up automatically. And so if you get to the fourth or fifth point, you know, fourth or fifth blog post, and they still haven't figured that out. I mean, if you've provided um, sufficient technical materials and support and whatnot, then thinking about how you might make sure they know that they are accountable for that. That's a type of grammar. That's a type of style that, or, or stylistic element that is important, that is um, essential to doing things online. You can't just put in a web address and not have it be linked. Um, so thinking about that and thinking about how you might do that on a gradual basis rather than in the first few weeks where they're still trying to like wrap their head around the form, around some of the technical pieces and the like. A few more technical recommendations um, within the blog post itself, you know, really look and encourage them to be doing linking, to be doing embedding, right? These are some of those technical uh, skills that they may already know, but if they don't, it's a good thing to know. Inevitably, their work is probably going to interact or intersect with some of these things, um, and they should have some working knowledge of it. Thinking about source attribution, and that's not just citing your sources, but that's also images. Uh, making sure they understand that they, you know, they while they technically can go and find any image through Google, uh, can they or should they legally be copying that image and putting it on their blog? Or is that violating copyright? And if so, then you know maybe they need to think about how to find um, Creative Commons licensed material that they can put on their blog or making sure that they're not necessarily making a copy and just embedding the video, excuse me, embedding the, the image. 
So really helping them think about some of those technical aspects around uh, how, excuse me again, how they actually construct and uh, develop some of the visual and uh, interactive parts of a blog. Lots of blogs will have the options around tags or labels, and these are just descriptors. These are just things around um, basically meta content that will help that blog be seen by the right by the people that are interested in those things. And so helping them understand, again, a little bit about how the web works and where information is stored and why something like providing labels is going to be useful so that they can actually be found and discovered by people interested in them. And as I said, examples, making sure you provide the different examples of these and other things that you want them to be doing or understanding. And then you will also want to show them how they can subscribe um, or encourage them to subscribe to the blog, either through an RSS feed or uh, many of them now also have email uh, sign up so they can get it via email so they know when new posts have been published on the blog. So a couple of resources for blog content, um, certainly YouTube, archive.org, which is the internet archive, uh, Creative Commons search, as I said, if they're gonna be posting images, they wanna make sure those images are, they, they can legally do so. Uh, you might also want um, to share in this link at the bottom here, there are some materials that would be useful uh, to consider to use to leverage in the creation of some assignment, um, as well as additional materials that might be useful for uh, you to share with your students. And then finally, the platforms to consider, uh, as I mentioned before, Tumblr, Blogger, WordPress, uh, those are the most well known, the most popular. I'm partial to Blogger because that's the first platform I started blogging on, but any of these ultimately will meet your needs at this stage. If you ever look to do more advanced heavy duty blogging, um, you might be, you know, you might be moved by uh, WordPress or Blogger or Tumblr, depending on what it is you're, you're, look, you're looking to get out of that experience. Uh, and there's plenty of others out there. I mean, there's a bajillion blog, blogging platforms out there. These are the top three that get most attention, that are most user-friendly uh, and super easy to get started up and running. Uh, and you can, you can make 500 blogs and delete all of them, which is to say, you know, there's nothing wrong with creating one, playing around with it, just so you get your, your bearings and then deleting it as you need to um, and starting a new one for the course that you would be using the blogging uh, tool with. So that is all the things about blogging that I could cover in this half hour. Uh, are there any other questions? And feel free to type them in the, in the group chat or just to unmute your mic and I will do my best to answer them. Uh, yes, this is definitely a lot to digest um, very much in a very short period of time. And that's why it is just a kind of big overview to get people thinking about and wondering or just to uh, understand what's out there. Um, so feel free to take a look at the materials, uh, give some time to process and figure out if this is up your alley or if this is something you would uh, at least want to have a conversation around before going forward as well, because we certainly are always around to help out with that. All right, if there aren't any more questions, I just want to say thank you all again. And uh, this webinar has been recorded, so I will be sharing it out with uh, people that signed up for this blog and others. Thank you all so very much and have a great day. I can find the stop record button. There we go.